Welcome to session nine. This is something I've been waiting to talk about for a while, and this topic is Taoism. It's a pretty elaborate and confusing one. Um, it's one of the disciplines that I've been following for a long time. I've waited this long for a few reasons. For one, it's really hard to wrap your mind around this topic in a way that you can express it rightly. And for two, I find it, I kind of felt that I needed to rush into it and make it this week because um, regardless of what time you're watching this recording, the time of this recording is one of social unrest <clears throat> uh, globally. So it might not seem uh, immediately like it's the part, you know, the tagline was Taoism, uh, counterculturalism, uh, the anarchy of the Eastern world. Uh, so <clears throat> why this is also going to be difficult is because the way that this philosophy is presented is more about the sum of its details than it is about specific details. And I hope that you'll uh, understand what I mean by that as we go forward. But I'm going to start with a few quotes from the Tao Te Ching just to give you the flavor of what I'm trying to present today. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength, but mastering yourself is true power. Those who know do not speak, and those who speak do not know. Sounds like an interesting remix on Socrates, right? Except for the Eastern world. And it's the last quote I have for now. If you understand others, you are smart. If you understand yourself, you are illuminated. If you overcome others, you are powerful. If you overcome yourself, you have strength. If you know how to be satisfied, you are rich. If you can act with vigor, you have a will. If you don't lose your objectives, you can be long lasting. If you die without loss, you are eternal. Every one of the quotes that you can find in the Tao Te Ching or the Zhuangzhou being the two main texts of Taoism, every one of them requires a long time of sitting with it. These are the opposite of cramming type books. For today, I'm not discussing the religion of Taoism, because I do believe that it's, there is a firm distinction between the philosophy and the religion of Taoism. Much in the same way as there was the alleged experience of Jesus Christ and what he preached, but then there is what has been made of him religiously. Very, very different things. So before I can get into the meat of what I really want to talk about, um, I'm going to give some very light historical context as to where this came out of. Uh, Lao Tzu was a wise man. That people knew him as a wise man. He left on a long trip of Hermitus. He came back uh, to the western border of China, which, you know, is what we would now refer to as Tibet. He was saddened by what he saw um, of his people. Uh, they, in his eyes, had diverted from the nature of things and the goodness of things. Uh, and a man that he met at the border, a guard, recognized him and asked him to write down his teachings as he went. And this writing would become the Tao Te Ching. This Tao Te Ching literally means 
the way and its power. That's one way of translating it. Qing being like the I Ching power, the way and its power. Uh, <clears throat> the Tao is something that we'll get into in a moment, which you could take an entire hour long conversation to. But essentially the reason that this book was written or claimed to be have written was so that man could find a way back to the nature of things. Um, what Lao Tzu saw was a transgression from the way, the right way to be. So Lao Tzu is the father of Taoism. Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism are an interplay. They are not necessary. They are distinct, but they aren't necessarily distinct. This is the difference between Eastern and Western ideologies. Usually with Western religions or spiritualities, they are very separate from each other. But in the East, these things tend to commingle more than um, Western minds might be used to. So <clears throat> Buddhism would get understood by the Taoists as a Taoist trope. The Nirvana experience or Bodhi of, of achieving enlightenment was described as obtaining the Tao. To become immortal or to escape the wheel would be to become one with the Tao, which is the same as in their philosophy. So they, they were kind of not necessarily appropriating, but acclimating Buddhism towards the Taoist philosophy. So it was as if Taoism was the main running engine um, a lot of the similarity between these two belief systems is this priority of what is referred to as Wu Wei. Um, Wu Wei is uh, unconscious action, natural action, a way of uh, unbridled or unfiltered raw experience which we'll get into that a little bit more too, but we're, we're doing the, the historical context here. <clears throat> so a lot of what Lao Tzu would preach during this time would be a reaction to the violent and vicious natures of everything around him. Uh, Taoists would later claim that Buddhism as it was made was something that was contrived for the Western barbarians, as it's put, to make them celibate, <laughs> to impose celibacy upon them, um, and that this was a kind of, they, they viewed Buddhism as a concocted religion for the detriment of foreigners stealing their culture, which is an interesting perspective. On a more profound level, Taoism and Buddhism coming together would constitute or be likened to Zen in Japan. Uh, this happened in the seventh century. This uh, liking of koans or paradoxes or plays on the duality of all things is the kind of root that we're reacting to here, the similarity between Taoism and Zen. So in this way, you could say Zen, Buddhism, Taoism, they have this interplay. Or you could say that Taoism was a true inspiration for what would become Zen or an ancestor of Zen. Now, before I get to the main part of this again, the other thing that I had to confront is Confucianism and Taoism. <clears throat> to put this very simply, Confucianism is a social construct. It is a way for people to behave. It's a social contract. Uh, it's about governing people and what they ought to do. Now, Taoism is a way of being. It's not about others. It's a way of being. Um, it's about yourself. It does mention the ways that the world is governed, but it's not preoccupied with that. In Confucianism, you respect those of higher position than you. 
uh, hierarchy. In the philosophy, and not the religion of Taoism, but the philosophy of Taoism, there is only the Tao. You can learn from those who know it, like teachers, but essentially all hierarchy in the world is unnatural. It's non-existent. So already you can start to see the flavor of why I say that Taoism's like anarchy. No hierarchy. That's what anarchy means. Anarchia without leaders. Both Confucianism and Taoism also arised around 550 AD. So that's a similarity. The last distinction I want to make is Confucianism at its most ideal level, believes in the brotherhood of humanity, whereas Taoism believes that everything is nature. So it's not even about humanity. Everything is a manifestation of the Tao. One last quote, fill your bowl to the brim and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife and it will be blunt. Chase after money and security, and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval, and you will be their prisoner. prisoner. <clears throat> Do your work and step back, the only path to serenity. So, again, personal emphasis. The foolishness of chasing money and security the foolishness of chronic action. So what, what is the Tao? You know, I've talked about this a lot already. The very act of saying what the Tao is, is not what the Tao is. <laughs> that is the paradoxical nature of it. If one is forced to talk about it, then I could say it is the primordial feminine essence of all things, the backdrop and the birther of all manifestations. It is the main purpose of life. Again, it's translated as the way. So it is the right way. This is where we can start to bleed into other disciplines. So in the shamanism talk, I mentioned if you ask the shamans, what the world needs, they would say they need to return to spirit. All of society is viewed as a great transgression away from spirit or the truth of things, the respect of all things. And in this way, it's like the Tao. The Tao is the old way, not just the old way, but the oldest way. It is always the way that things should be. All modern issues, all modern power plays, all modern discrepancies and miseries are because we have gone off the path. This is the view. Um, <clears throat> it is viewed to be everywhere. It shields and nourishes all things, but doesn't lord over them. That's the difference here too, because that's the difference between us conceiving it as God in the Western understanding is because it does not lord over anything. We get food from nature. We get our air from nature. We get our home from nature. We get everything from nature, yet we view ourselves apart from it. That is where our misstep is. Um, it provides it. Regardless of what we're doing, it is providing for us. Uh, that's the um, unendingness aspect of the Tao. So this is what I really wanted to talk about is at this point. I don't know how long I'm going to go on about this because it's more about what we're doing in the modern day and how we can understand this from a Taoism perspective, okay? So our society right now, as it's been built up and as we are raised, is built on the idea that we need to control life. We need to control it in every kind of way, 
in agriculture, that's a big one, how the trees should grow, where the animals should be, where they shouldn't be. We try to control our own lives through careers, right? You got to have a career, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and you got to go that way, right? Control it, take it by the balls, right? By, uh, we control it by means of nations, nations and states and empires, all means of exploitation to go control the land, dig out whatever we want from it and leave the rest however we care to. Ultimately, this value of control, that we must have control over things, leads to tyranny. It's inevitable. That is the main form of what our mentality is. So if we must feel like we're in control, this neurosis that we have, tyranny will always be around. For whatever reason, we feel like we need to be in control. And we condition ourselves and each other to approach life in this way. That's why we become so schizoid when things don't go our way. Um, and especially in the rich, you see it when their money doesn't buy something, somebody doesn't obey. You see that schizoid nature of losing control, right? Power. But the wiser we get as people, we realize that our great plans, our great expectations in life, are, they're faulty. That unpredictable things change, always messes up. Our tremendous, glorious plans. And here comes nature, as we call it, right? To screw it up. And it's us against it, right? But change always comes around. We're always uh, undermined by that if we want to approach it with this kind of mind. So only when we give up control that you actually get anything that you've been looking for. So I'll say, personally, the things that I appreciate most in my life have come about serendipitously, synchronistic, synchronistically, coincidentally, the things that I've planned and planned and carved out, and even if I've gotten them, I appreciate them less. I find this to be true. So it's about this letting go. We can only experience the way, this way, when we've given up control. When we're controlling things, we are blind. We're like a bull with our eyes pinned forward. And we don't see what's going on around us. We don't see the repercussions of our movements. So in this way, this giving up control is what is where Wu Wei comes in, this concept of Wu Wei. Non-doing, non-action, effortless action, spontaneity and trust of the greater fabric of things, to not be so short-sighted, to realize that there are greater functions at work, and to accept it, and to do nothing. This is Wu Wei, to let go. To those that like uh, ever caught up with like the Dragon Ball Z and anime, this is what the whole Ultra Instinct thing is about. There's plenty of pop culture references to this, especially in martial arts. The ultimate attain attaining of mastery is when you're doing so without thinking. It's completely spontaneous. So this is the way of nature. Non-doing, non-action, effortless action, right? Do you think that the river gets tired from its labors? No, it just does. And I'll get into more of the specificity as we go on. So we are, here's the other distinction too, because we don't see this in most of the religions that we've gone over and spiritualities. Only in animism is this also the case. It is the statement that we are nature. There is no separating from it. We are not a fluke. We are not special. We are not something different. 
We are nature through and through. Our insides, our muscles, our cells have structures that are seen in everything. We are not different. We are taught by our civilization now that we are alien from this world, that we are different, that we are somehow either far worse than everything else, i.e. humanity is a virus, or oppositely, that we are so special. And that gives us the license to have our way with the plants, the animals, each other, ruling over nature, everything around us. We are raised to believe that we live in a hostile world where nothing cares about us. The universe is just a mindless, mechanistic, formulaic, cold contrivance. This leads us to be fearful of everything, everything around us, including each other, because we're all just use and abuse. This controlling aspect is where our fear comes from. This complete lack of trust is the cancer and neurosis that underlies our modern decay, our nihilism, our existentialism, our, our feeling of complete helplessness and, and being trapped is completely about this aspect of needing, needing to be in control. This is what leads us to think that the future is doomed, that it's all for nigh. So the most punk rock, the most anarchic thing, the most countercultural supreme that we can ever do is to trust it. It, I-T, the greater it. To get beyond our small vision and to trust the greater fabric instead of believing that we need to fight it. This trust, this letting go, it threatens all social, governmental, religious, spiritual, and structural systems. This structural system that we've grown and been taught to digest. We don't see birds lording over trees and telling them how they ought to grow. We don't see the stream punishing beavers for how they act or telling them how to hunt for what they're looking for. The natural way does not control anything, anything. To go from one nation to another, to go from one people to another and impose a way of being is equally absurd. For any one of us to force our beliefs onto others, this is equally absurd. This is hard for us to understand because it's completely foreign to us. So I understand if you're hearing this and there's ways that you're trying to figure it out, but I'm, I'm hoping to give enough to really push this through. As another quote, the wise man knows that it is better to sit on the bank of a remote mountain stream than to be an emperor of the whole world. Prioritize fulfillment over gain prestige, fame, luxury. So 
we lack acceptance because we don't have it. And then we dispower, disempower others and we give this power over to what? A religion. We give our power over to a state, to a government, to bosses, to religious leaders. And these things should serve us, but we're serving it. Allowing for everything to be the same forever. Minor changes will not change this equation. This is how it is chiming out. Allowing for everything to be as it is. For everything to be completely authentic. For everything to be genuine and untrodden upon is beauty. That's where it's at. None of us should have the slightest fear of showing our vulnerability. That is the way it should be. That is the way. We think if we're all accepting that we would get nothing done, right? I'm saying let go of control. You don't have to control things. And then you think, well, nothing would get done. And I say, tell that to the river. Is it not carving through tremendous stone? Tell that to the trees that annually produce fruit. Tell that to the birds that they should sing on a timetable, right? Timetables are our thing, away from the way. We would produce much more efficiently if we were left to do things naturally instead of forcibly. This control of ours leads to all sorts of contradictions and we, we're gonna gripe about it in every form. Uh, but again, this is written in 550, like how many years ago is that? 1,500 roughly. And it says things like, the petty thief is imprisoned, but the big thief becomes Lord, right? Nowadays, we have the same cynicism. You see a poor person do something very small and they get put into that prison system that is effectively slave labor for life or whatever. And then you see People who fake economic collapses and collect all the, all the money, millions and billions, fine. They're fine. They're Lord. They're like princes. This is no different. It's not, it's not been different for a very long time. So what is the, uh, you know, what can we say? I mean, if left to be natural, we would be more efficient. We would not live in fear. We would not be obliged to duties that slowly decrod us. We wouldn't be surrounded by people who are other than us. We would not be subject to oppressive governments. We wonder why there's this trope that great people are killed, right? Jesus is the, great, is the great example. If we're talking about more older times, Justin Martyr, who was the inspiration of the name Martyr, was martyred for speaking out in such a way. Giordano Bruno, another old name. But of course, today we think of John Lennon, JFK, Martin Luther. All these people speaking out has a flavor of this, the acceptance of everybody, the dignity of everybody, returning to a way that appeases everybody, that everybody can be themselves and they are not oppressed. This goes opposite to the grain of humanity and society as it's been built. This is why they go. It can't have it. 
This is the collective hypnosis of society at large. It repels itself. It is completely repulsed by the concept of returning to the blind, cold, chaotic, anarchic nature of things. It must do everything to protect this tower as it's been built. A wise one will be seen as a fool in a profoundly sick society. So, to be a little less serious for a moment and to bring it back to where I was at. Confucianism is built on the idea that leaders of a society, if leaders of a society are enlightened, all else will fall in place, right? This would be a simple solution. If only we had the right leaders, right? If only we had the right people up at the top, truly enlightened, humble people, all else would fall into place. And this is where Taoism, again, goes completely against it. Any form of hierarchy is unnatural. It is a detriment to everybody. And, and likewise, enlightenment is not for a chosen few. It is for everyone. No initiations, no pay to play, no birthrights, no firewalls, no bars to enter. Everybody deserves it. Where in nature is hierarchy? Now, yes, you can argue as we have projected ourselves into nature, we think of apex predators, right? Completely missing the greater dynamic of what nature is doing. It needs the apex predator as much as it needs the bottom feeders and the fungi. It's all part of the circle. It's not a ladder. It's not a hierarch. Okay. Any political ideology no matter which one we're talking about, okay? There's a lot of debate about this now, right? Across the world. Democracy seems ideal. Okay. Communism seems ideal to some. Okay. Capitalism obviously reigns supreme. Oligarchy, theogarchy, monarchy, authoritarianism, all of these in this way would lead to tyranny in some form. The oppression of some over others. Say that you have the perfect democracy, but some people are not completely wise towards the idea of the few, and then they are oppressed by the greater majority. In every kind of way, this spells out the same corruption of ruling, of controlling over others, of not letting them do what they do. The other skepticism here is okay, if everybody's free to do what they want, obviously they'll do all the terrible things, kill, rape, plunder, pillage. And what isn't understood in this is that these things happen as a result of the neurosis of society. You create the polarities that make these things possible. If you have great riches, you will have great thieves. If you have a system that oppresses and condemns and does not hear to the heart and the empathic level of an individual, it will create monsters. That is the consequence of this imbalance, of not going with the way. Likewise, religion stands to control. So I'm not just, talk, I'm not just dogging on, on governments here. It imposes hierarchies. Traditions in themselves aren't bad. They can be beautiful, they can be natural. However, if it devolves into dogma and seeks to imprison uh, people's minds and make, make them act in certain ways, this is not okay. This is more about control and power, which is why you can be cynical and why throughout the course I have to throw shade at Christianity uh, in its history of power play. I mean, look at the Vatican. What, what has come of it? You've got funding World War II. You've got child molestation. You've got the Crusades. You've got the Inquisitions. Power. 
power, power. They, in this, you know, it's that absolute power corrupts absolutely. It, it, you, you focus the hierarchy and then you, ha and then you will devolve into a perverse power hungry entity. We see this in far beyond just the religion of Christianity. So I've gotten real, <laughs> real serious with this. But what about life itself, right? I'm talking about the exterior angles of all of this. And I'm preaching, you know, to not, to, to let go um, and why there is the uh, perverse nature of society as we see it, why all these things happen. But the truth is that Taoism is uh, a very lighthearted way. It is a very lighthearted belief system. And it's very boundary dissolving. There is this concept of fasting your mind. And it's to say that especially in the modern day, we are very addicted to yin energy. So this is where yin and yang come in. Yin is that masculine. And then we have again these concepts of hypermasculinity. And it's because of our need to do, right? Again, career, work aspire, uh, accumulate wealth, do, 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 do. And if you're, not, uh, if you're not doing things, then you're a waste of space. You're wasting your life. You'll never amount to anything, right? Sound familiar? Fasting your mind is yang of allowing yourself to not do things. So we're always flooding our minds with some sort of information, the TVs on, the news, the computers, uh, socializing, always needing some stimulation. We're addicted to the stimulation. But when do we ever let all these, these, this mess of our minds settle into a serene solution? It is allowing yourself to be receptive, to be empty. And we don't like this. We, we think that it's like boring or useless. But in doing this, the fasting of the mind and being quiet and of just doing nothing, you start to feel like the ends of your body are not the ends of you. I know it sounds really abstract but you aren't an ego anymore. You get that other end of what's happening in the world. You get that different way of thinking, that different mentality. And this is healthy. This allows you to calm your nerves. It cleans out your nervous system. It makes you think clearer. It makes you able to act quicker. And you don't chill in order to do better. You just chill. And in this, too, is where we find this lightheartedness that I'm talking about. There's a lot of talk of dreams. And I find that, you know, um, I mentioned it last week when mentioning Hinduism. Dreams are a big part of Eastern mysticism. So this is the kind of the meme of the Zhuangzhou. It's this quote. Once upon a time, I dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, and all intents and purposes of being a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was myself. Soon I awakened. There I was, myself again. Now, I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming that I'm a man. This is what I mean when I'm talking about boundary dissolving.
it's allowing the ambiguity of your mind. So in the beginning, when I said that Taoism isn't about its particular definitions, it's about its greater function. When you read the books, it's not about each and every specific line. It's about how all these lines are acclimating you to a way of thinking through puzzle work or like stacking logs. A similar note, during our dreams, we do not know we are dreaming. We may even dream of interpreting a dream. Only on waking do we know that it was a dream. Only after the great awakening will we realize that this is a great dream. This is a dream. There's many ways to interpret that. But it's to say that we are dreamers. <laughs> we are not participating in the reality that we assume we're participating in. We are very convinced of the things that appear in our present. We are very convinced of the ways that we've been programmed to think about the world. None of us are out of this, you know? All of us are in this together in this way. But that reality, capital R reality, is a feeling of non-self. You are not aware of how you look. You are not aware of how you may be perceived. You are effectively a child, an animal even. You just do. You don't think about doing. You do. You're in a chronic state of spontaneity. So let me address some of these more particular questions. There is often translation of the word God in these texts and that there is a belief of this all being created. This is unique to the Eastern world. But it's not about, it's about going with that way that it was created. It's not anything else. There's no classification or anthropomorphization of this creator. I also want to address that we might wonder about how we can do this in the modern world, right? Like, how can we live by this? And it's essentially that if you want to change the world, if you want to fix the world, if your heart bleeds for everything that you see around you, there is much that can be done out there. Yes, this is true. But the most important thing is you. And what I mean by that is we are here to deal with ourselves, ultimately. We will die alone. The world will go on. We must confront our own issues. If we come into a position of influence, we should do so well-mindedly. Don't be fooled by the easy fixes of society. If you say there are good people, there will have to be bad people. If you 
praise, you'll notice this, there's certain characters like this. Those that praise you, make you feel good, will always be the ones that will damn in its place. This is how things go. If you say that these people are good, then there will be the others. This is why communes have often turned into cults. They preach free love, but then they say that we are the star children and exclude everybody else. And then in time, you see it just turn and corrupt itself. And then there's killing and all sorts of weird shit that happens. This is this very same misunderstanding of the duality of things. No, and this is what it would sound like. Nobody is better and nobody is worse. It's hard for people to accept. But why is it hard for you to accept? There can be teachers. This is a natural way. A mother shows its daughter or its son how to ride a bicycle. A mother bird shows the baby how flying is done in many different forms. This is natural. This is okay. When we grow things, agriculture, monoculture, pesticides, this is not okay. This is not right for the trees. They want to be around other things as it is naturally. All things can be made in this way. You wonder if this society was brought into action, you know, complete naturalism. How could we get food? And I will remind you, in animism, we talk to the old natives. When they would go get the herds of the buffalo, they wouldn't need to hunt because the buffalo, through a series of events, would give itself over to them. It would, you would be a part of the family of nature itself. You could approach all things like they were your brothers and sisters, not just humans. You would be a part of it seamlessly. And in natural nature, untouched nature, you see that none of these animals go hungry. They all have what they need. They all know where to go. They all know what they need to know. Trust it. Trust that it provides. This is the leap of faith. And I realize that, you know, even if everybody is to uh, go along with this, right, there is still the question of society. I understand that. But in ourselves, the most that we can do with the situation that we have is to be right. It's not about knowing. It's not about being superior. It's not about becoming some guru doing power schemes. You will not be fooled. You will have a feeling of peace, a feeling of understanding, of tranquility. What more could we ask for? We think that all these things, whether they're toys, cars, trucks, Religions even, certain spiritualities, people, relationships, certain types of relationships. This is not, this is not going to end. It's not about coaxing the, the, the sacred gem out of the, the nature, the cold nature of things. It's about going with Go with it. It's stupid to swim upstream. It's natural to go down it. 
So in regards to death, you mentioned this last week in the afterlife conversation. The Taoists don't have a lot to say about it. They have a lot of open, open-ended things, but they believe, and again, this is much like shamanism, that how the shamanism would say, everything is spirit. The rocks, the trees, the plants, the air, everything has spirit. So in this way, you are everything, everything that is around you. You came from this. You cannot escape this. This is not something to escape. It's something to revel in, in the same way as the Tao. The Tao is eternal. When you are one with this understanding, when you are in this state of, of, of open perceptibility, of non-action, of boundary dissolving, you are experiencing eternity. So again, this isn't a classical understanding of death. This is boundary dissolving. This is kind of psychedelic. Because what, what we might want to be said is that, you know, what heaven, hell, that whole dynamic, right? Or different realms or different life. And this is all well and good. But this is saying something much more abstract. And that is that it's a way of mind. It's a way of being. You be. That's it. You don't think. You join it. And it might be that it shoots you back. And it might be that it shoots you over. And it might be that it shoots you up or it shoots you down. But if you can join it, then that is fulfillment. We came from it. We'll return to it. So I'm not sure which, uh, what more I'd want to address about this. This is obviously a topic that is very foreign to us in more ways than the fact that it's an Eastern thought. It's foreign to us because of how we have grown up what we've been told, what we've told each other, and what we've enforced in each other. To accept, to let go, to trust, to let things be, to revel in its beauty. These are things that should not be strange to us. In this time of social unrest, solidarity, Empathy, all these things are direly thirsted for. We need it. But if we find a new age, one that overthrows the last, it will be the same story of replacing the faces of oppression by reacting to violence with violence, by reacting to hatred with hatred. This will play the same teeter-totter game. Unless we are different, unless we as people, as individuals, as in you, are different. You think different. You want different. You don't play the same game on repeat. You don't just switch the DJ board of the same old story. That's the sum of what I want to touch on today. I don't want to belabor much more. So with that, I'll, I'll end it for today. <laughs>